And so, um, but let's go ahead and get started. We need to get started. So before we get started, I'd like to ask uh, Brother Clayton, sir, if you pray for the, if you pray for the, uh, the Bible study. Thank you. And Father, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful evening. I pray for the Bible study that open our hearts and minds. You just bless the night, bless the pastor as he preaches, and just open our hearts and minds again, Lord, to receive what you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So we're in Colossians chapter 2. We got through verse 10 last week. This is our fourth uh, Bible study in Colossians, and we're going to pick up just right out the gate of verse 11, verse 11 and 12. And so uh, we're talking about this idea of the second chapter as being complete in Christ. Complete in Christ. In verse 11, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And so what do we see here? That We see this idea here that Christ is the one that made the change in our lives. We didn't do it ourselves. Amen? Amen. We had to believe, but then once we believed, God made the effect. God made the effect. In other words, we have to give God permission to change our hearts. That's really what it is. We repent of our sin, we turn to God, we say, God, now you do what needs to be done. We have to, because God's a perfect gentleman, amen? amen? He doesn't force himself on anybody. He wants us all to go to heaven, but we have to willingly surrender our hearts to Christ so he can fit us out for glory. Take his righteousness and impute it unto us so that we can go to glory. Because as we've been sharing, heaven's perfect, only perfection can be there. We were born in sin, shape, and iniquity. We're born, uh, you could say in a sense, uh, defective because of our flesh. Our flesh is faulty. We're born in sin, shape, and iniquity. And so if we, there's only two places we can go, heaven or hell. God wants us to go to heaven. So God has to start the process to prepare us for glory. Amen? Because Amen. we want to go to a perfect heaven. But if we're not perfect, then if we went there, then guess what? Heaven wouldn't be what? Wouldn't be perfect. Wouldn't be perfect. It wouldn't be heaven. Right. And so therefore, if we want to go to heaven... I want to go to heaven, then God's got to get us prepared for the place that he's prepared for us. Amen. Amen. And that starts when we accept Christ into our life and we say, Jesus, come into my life. Lord, I let my old life go. Come into my life. Prepare my heart. Get me ready for heaven. And it's, it's glorious because we begin to experience heaven down here. We get to walk with him. We get to talk with him. We get to feel his presence, the whole the presence of the Holy Spirit, and just walk with God and get to know God better. And then we, we begin to learn what the scripture, what the scripture means when it says godliness with contentment is great gain. We realize that all that God has for us is greater than everything else this world has to offer. We thank God for homes and lands. We thank God for nice clothing. We thank God for food. Amen. Amen. I like barbecue, and I'm, I know uh, Clayton was talking to me about it just the other day, and they, they think of maybe doing something on Sunday at the home. But, um, but, but all these things that God adds to us, we don't look to those to fulfill us because we found the thing that really meets the longing in our heart, and that's our relationship with God. Yeah. Christ becomes so real to us that that becomes the most important thing in our life because that is the thing that satisfies our heart. Yeah. That's the thing that satisfies our life. So we become, with godliness, with contentment, there's great gain. And so here we see in this, in this portion of Scripture, he's beginning to explain that this process of sanctification, this process of becoming like Christ, this process of becoming righteous is all because of God. It's all because of God. He does it all. We just give God permission to do so. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> we give God... So let's look at it. You were changed in the in, on the inside by Christ alone. You were changed on the inside by Christ alone. Follow me, if you will, to Romans chapter 2, verse 29, keeping your hand there in Colossians chapter 2. So we're going to go back to Romans. We just finished that Bible study not too long ago. We're going to be referencing Romans quite a bit tonight. So Romans chapter 2 and verse 29. And we're just going to look at that. We're going to read that to you. Now, notice we were talking about circumcision here. We're going to establish this in just a moment. And here in verse 29, he says, But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And so here he mentions circumcision. So under the Old Testament covenant, when a Jew, when a, when a Hebrew boy was born, he had to be circumcised the eighth day. And so that was a way that they set themselves apart. Now, they didn't walk around showing off their circumcision. Can I get an amen? Amen. So then why did God choose that as a method? Hey, bro, check out my circumcision. That's not the way, that's not the way that works. Sorry. So okay. Let me know what circumcision is here. Everybody knows what that is? All right. It's kind of a personal thing, right? 
I'm not going to ask if you're circumcised. Please don't ask if I am. I'm not. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so you say, well, it's kind of a crazy thing that God would have them do that. Well, it kind of represents two things. One thing, first of all, it's private. Can I get an amen? amen? It's something that we know is if, if we're men and we've been circumcised, we know it, but we keep it to it's it's personal. And so it is when a man gets saved, it's personal. Yeah. It's a private experience. It's something that changes the but also it's a sensitive area. It's tender. And so he makes reference that when God refers to being circumcised, he talks about cutting away the stony flesh or the the stone of the stony or cutting, cutting away the stone of uh, on our hearts and giving us a heart of flesh. He applies it to the heart now. Like God, when man gets saved, when we get saved, God takes away that hard heart and gives us a heart that can love, a heart that can be touched, a heart that can experience joy, a heart that can even weep too. We just become more alive because God cuts the hardness away and we begin to live again. Amen? Amen. We begin to enjoy life. You know, so, and so God's so good to us. And so this is what he's talking about here. Uh, as I just read to you, this idea of being circumcised, the circumcision is that of a heart. And that's really what he's after here. So he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So if you go back to Colossians and just look at that scripture one more time, um, in verse 11, where we started, he says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Notice what he says here. Made with, made what? Without hands. Without hands. So he's not talking about the physical Old Testament circumcision, because that was obviously made with hands. We talking about a spiritual circumcision made without hands and the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And so the idea, notice also, it's without hands. So what, what's he saying? It's not something that we do ourselves. It's something that God does. God does the circumcising. Amen? Amen. God does the transformation. God does the changing. Reverend Torres, do me a favor, sir, and close the door. The blessing. Make sure. Oh, William's there. All right. Praise God. God is good. Amen. And so God has to make the change. God has to make the change. There's some other scripture references we can look at. Let's just look at, we're in Colossians already. So let's just look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. Just kind of as a, reiterate this. It says here, to whom, in verse 27 of Colossians chapter 1, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. So God cuts away the hardness of the heart gets rid of the old man, and Christ becomes formed in our hearts. So this idea here is that we are changed on the inside by Christ alone. Jesus alone made the change, the change you made without hands, without somebody physically coming down and manipulating you. But it's not, it's not uh, me coming down and manipulating you, right? It's God coming into your heart and changing your heart. Amen. That's what we're after. We want God to do the work in your life. We want God to make the change. We want it to be genuine, organic, uh, sincere, honest. No, no, uh, no uh, ulterior motives, but just the Lord begins to impress upon your heart and you begin to make changes. You begin to do things in your life. You begin to clean up your music collection and listen to music that glorifies God, that puts your mind, puts your headspace in the right place. Amen? Amen. You begin to clean up the books that you listen to and, the, and the, the, maybe the shows that you watch or the videos that you view. You begin to clean those up because you want your mind to be in the right place because you no longer belong to yourself, you belong to Christ. But even more importantly, the best thing in the world is walking with Jesus. Amen. The best experience in the world is walking with Christ and you don't want to interrupt that experience. Are you listening? It's not always just do's and don'ts. It's like, we just want to have the glory. Like when I started dating my wife, it was such a, I was so excited to found somebody that I, was, that I possibly could marry and I obviously ultimately did that it wasn't hard for me to uh, let a lot of things go. I stayed up all night talking to her on the phone. Let my sleep go so I could talk to her, you know. I'd get up in the morning and uh, it was just, I looked forward to seeing her every day. It was something I wanted to do. That relationship was fresh. It was new. It was something I was, I, 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 nobody had to force me to do those things. I willingly did those things. Amen? And so it is when our relationship with God is, there's joy and there's peace and there's a, we really love that relationship, then we just begin to remove things out of our lives that are not conducive to that relationship. Many years ago, I'm, I'm going to share this because I think it just fits right here. I was listening on the radio. There was this man who is relatively fit. Now, you're on the radio, when you're listening to the radio, you can't see him. And so the narrator or the, or, the, or the talk show host said to him, he said, you must be on a very strict diet. 
He said, no. He said, you probably can't eat a lot of things. He said, no. He said, I can eat anything I want to eat. He said, I can eat anything I want to eat. He said, I just choose to feel good. It wasn't that I couldn't eat certain things. He said, I just feel really good, and I don't want to mess up feeling good. And that's the right way to look at things. It's not you can't. You, there's a lot of things you can do, but you choose not to do them because you like feeling good. Amen? There's something about having a clean heart and a clean conscience and knowing everything's right between you and the Lord, and that walk with God is so glorious that you choose that over the opposite, which is what? Being under condemnation and guilt and all these other things. And so we want to choose to feel good. We want to choose to feel good, do those things that are going to help us. So it says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3, I'm just going to read this to you. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Uh, what's he saying here? That we, we're, the, we're the spiritual circumcision. We worship God in the Spirit. We have no confidence in our own physical abilities. We don't walk around with an ego. I'm a, such a good Christian because I'm so disciplined. If we are good Christians and we are disciplined, it's because God's helped discipline us. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are we are by the grace of God. We don't have egos. We don't think we're better than anybody else. We are we are by the grace of God. The Bible says when a man stands on him, take heed, lest he fall. I want to take you through a couple of uh, verses and just look at these. And then I would like to read something to you. It's a little excerpt out of a, a book, that uh, an old Puritan book. And just he really, I'm going to read it because he says much better what I'm trying to tell you right now. So follow me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. The Gospel of John chapter 15. And uh, this, and we're just going to look at a series of the scriptures and we're going to tie this all in. Pay attention to time. In other words, it's God does the work, not ourselves. We just give God the permission to do the work. That's the difference. We sit, hands off. Well, I want to help you out, Lord. Get your hands off. Let God do the work. Let God do the work. When my wife's working in the kitchen, I don't mess with her. I leave her alone because I know I'm going to get the benefit later of eating whatever she's making. I don't go in there and try to tell her how to cook it. Well, maybe a little more salt, a little more Tony Sacheries, a little more hot sauce over here. No way. I stay out. Of it. She's proven to me she knows how to cook. Leave her alone. Let her do her thing. And then I get to sit back and enjoy it. And sometimes people want to tell God how to fix their life. Just hands off. Let God do what he God wants to do. Trust the master chef. He'll, he knows how to make a good dish. Amen? Amen? All right. So here in this portion of Scripture, John chapter 15, in verse 5, Jesus says this. He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that, abideth, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Right? For without me, you can do nothing. If God doesn't help us, we're just going to fall on our face. We're not going to be able to be successful. Follow me to 2 Corinthians now. 2 Corinthians. Now, I'm not preaching that you're weak. And I'm not sharing that because that, I don't believe that. I believe you're strong. But I believe that where we want to go, it, it requires divine influence. The where we want to get to, it requires something greater than us to get there. This isn't just us pulling up by our bootstraps. We're depending on Jesus to get where, we, where we're going to get where we need to get to. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Excuse me. And verse 5. But if any man have caused grief... Is that right? No, I'm in the wrong spot. Excuse me. Chapter 3, verse 5. Forgive me. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Notice how what he says here. This is Paul writing. Our sufficiency is of God. Amen? Amen. We don't do it on our own. God helps us. This is why we need to realize that we can be children of God because God's going to help us get there. It doesn't matter where our starting point is, because if God, if we lean on the Lord, the Lord will help us get there. The Lord will help us become a child of God. He will help us see that realized in our life. It happens the minute the process begins, the minute we accept Him, we become as many as received Him, to then gave you power or authority to become the sons of God. God gives us the authority to say, I am a child of God. And then God begins the process of helping us fit in His family. If you'd like, if I were to go move down... Uh, uh, if I were to go move down to Texas and uh, go hang out with the Hollies, I'm sure I'd have to learn a thing or two how to live in that family. they would be like, you ain't from around these parts. You have to teach them to too. Just like when I first met my, my wife's family. There. He's not from around these parts. He's a city slicker. But I'll never forget when I walked in Paul's Cafe. 
I'll never forget that. Walked in Paul's Cafe. I was in the military back in the day. I wanted to meet my wife's family before, before uh, we got married. So she took me to Paul's Cafe, and I walked in there, and I, didn't, I don't even remember what Mr. Paul looked like. But he yelled across. We walked in the front door. He yelled from behind the kitchen. He goes, hoo-wee, breath of fresh hair, short hair and no earrings. That's what he said. And we just started like, hello, sir, nice to see you. But he was just like, that was Mr. Paul. But it was just like, wow, this is a different world. This is not the world I grew up in. So God's good to us, amen? Amen. 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 But it was, God is good. So I was coming into a new culture. When, when we come into Christ, we're coming into a whole new and living way. Yeah. It's a new culture. Old things pass away. All things become new. It's a call. It, we, we get to live in love. We get to live in goodness. We get to have real friends, uh, people that really care about us, people that want what's best for us. They're not competing with us. Amen? Amen. I'm not like, oh, I wish I had a Tesla like Uriel's got one. I wish I had cool glasses to take pictures like he does. No, I'm just happy he's got them. Amen? <laughs> Amen. I, I think that's awesome that God's given him the ability to have that. I don't know where that came from. We don't, I don't care about that. Reverend Torres got a new car. Thank you, Jesus. God gave him a new car. Amen? Amen. We're not, we're not in this battle about, well, I got an old car. We know. When you're blessed, it, to me, it's a blessing. Yes. Amen? And so I just like it when God's kids are blessed. It's a blessing. All right, moving along. Let's see where I'm at here. So we are, what did I say? Second read the chapter. We already read that. We already read that. Let's go to Philippians now, chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Back to Colossians. Just right before that, you got get myself. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. I'm trying to share the heart of God with you here. Not just teach you a bunch of rules. This is so much glorious. There's so much going on here. He says in verse 13 of, second, of Philippians chapter 2, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God is working in you to do what? To, to do his good pleasure. But once again, we, he's a perfect gentleman, so we have to allow him to do that. We have to say, God, you direct my steps. This, um, this is a pathway I haven't been before. I need you to help me out. And then finally, Romans chapter 7 and verse 18. Go back to Romans. In fact, you've already been there, so you know how to get there. Romans chapter 7 and verse 18, where he says this. And I like this. For I know. See, I know. I know. I know. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, that's this physical flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, and how to perform that which is good, I find it not. Even though we're saved and we have Christ living in our hearts, we still live in a fallen body. And everybody says amen. amen. It doesn't want to go to church, it wants to sleep in. It's attracted to all kinds of lusts and passions. It doesn't want to be in subjection to the will of God. But the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The spiritual man in your life must grow and become stronger than the carnal man. As one Indian said, he said, I, have two, I feel like I have two dogs living inside of me. I got one that wants to do wrong and one that wants to do right. And so the fellow asked the Indian, he said, which one wins? He said, depends on which one you feed. <laughs> it's true. It depends on which one you feed. Amen? Amen? And so we need to feed the spiritual man so the spiritual man becomes stronger than the carnal man. And we can do that by the grace of God. God will help us. So, now I want to read this to you. Now, this is an excerpt from a really old, old book written way before we were even thought about, okay? And, um, but I really like this by an old Puritan. He says this, He is the strength of all his saints, speaking about Jesus. He is the strength of all his saints in their war against sin and Satan. Some, uh, pr pr some propound a question whether there be a sin omitted in the world in which Satan hath not a part. But if the question were, were whether there be any holy action performed without the special assistance of God's concurring, that is resolved, without God's concurring, that is resolved. For without me, you can do nothing. In other words, there's nothing that's good, that, there's nothing that's, good there's nothing that's right, there's nothing that's holy without Jesus' help. Amen? Amen? If something gets done right, if there's any glory, if there's any praise, it's because of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so he begins to go on, without me, you can do nothing. Think, think, uh, thinking strength of God... Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiencies of God. We apostles, we saints that have habitual grace, yet this lies, this lies like water at the bottom of a well, which will not ascend with all, with all our pumping till God pour in, its, pour in his exciting grace. His exciting grace. So like an old pump back in the day, in order for that pump to work, you get a little hand pump. I don't know if you ever had the privilege of working one, but there needs to be a suction. And so sometimes you got to pour water in to get the pump to work. 
And so it is that without water going in to provide that suction, kind of like a straw, no amount of pumping will be of any effect. You can just go and go and go and try to pump that, get that hand pump to pump the water out. But unless you pour water in first, nothing's going to happen. And so it is we can put all our effort and all our work into something, but without God's initial help, nothing's going to happen. What do you mean? How can, how can this be better uh, illustrated? God has to first touch our hearts before we can believe on him. God has to first reach out and, and tap us on the shoulder and get our attention and go, hey, I love you. And then we go, oh, God loves me. He's for me. Amen? Amen. So that, but that's, once again, there's no room for pride because if God didn't reach out and touch us, we'd still be hopelessly lost. Thank God for his grace. Amen? Amen. That divine influence upon the heart and its reflection of life. So God divinely touches us and taps our hearts and then we respond to it in faith. He goes on to share some more here. Um, if I can find my place, yes. It is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. These are the various different verses we just looked up. He makes the heart new, and having made it fit for heaven, for heavenly motion, setting every wheel as it were in its right place, then he winds it up, and by his actuating grace, and sets it on going, the thoughts to stir, the will to move, and to make towards the holy object present, yet here the chariot is set, and cannot ascend the hill of action till God puts his shoulder to the wheel. Now, this is written before, the, before the, uh, the combustion engine. But what's the idea here? That we get saved. We give our lives to Jesus. God sets our life in order. Just like putting together a chariot or putting together a, a go-kart or putting together a vehicle. But in order for that vehicle, but the vehicle still, without the power of God, cannot go anywhere. And so the idea is God sets us right. We give our life to Jesus. He puts things right. He gets rid of sin out of our lives. He washes us. He cleanses us. He makes us every whit whole. He forgives us. We're now right with God. But now we need the power of God or the shoulder of God to push us along the way. He can liken this to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because he's the power of God in the salvation. He's the power behind the chariot. And he's the engine in the car, so to speak. And this is what he's trying to get at. He so he goes on, To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And so we need God to move and put power into our hearts. I like, and he wraps it up on this. Think of it this way. Think of a ladder. God is at the bottom of the ladder and at the top also. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Yea, helping and lifting the soul at every moment, at every round in his ascent to an holy action. And so this is exactly what God does. We give our lives to Christ. We begin to reach up on the ladder of faith. But God is pushing us up and God is pulling us up. He's below us and he's above us. He's working in our lives on every side to help us get where we need to go. But we have to willingly reach. Amen? We have to willingly believe and reach out and trust God. God tests us. He, he might challenge us. Hey, I want, you to, I want you to give up your music collection and, and go in. And I want you to really begin to clean up your music collection and get rid of your rock and roll and really get some gospel music and something. And, well, I don't know. I really like it. But if, you know, you never can give something up for God, but you're not going to benefit from it. That's right. Remember years ago, God was dealing with my heart about getting rid of a camera. I said, Brother Rossi, what's sinful about a camera? Nothing. But I felt like the Lord was just dealing with me about getting rid of this, this old Canon uh, reflex, reflexive mirror camera. And, I, and now, now the thing's archaic. But I, I just, I really like that camera. It was one of the first things I ever saved up over, that was over $1,000 that I bought. And I saved a bunch of money and bought it. And I just kept going to the altar. I kept feeling the Lord say, give it, you need to give up the camera. There's nothing wrong with a camera. See, not everything has to be sinful. God just touches our heart. He wants to see what, where our treasure is. And so finally, I just said, all right, whatever. And I took it to the pawn shop, and I hawked it and got some cash for it. I'm like, you can have the stupid camera. I want to show God that I belong to him. About a week or I think about a couple months went by, and uh, a brother was in Bible school with me. This is in Bible school, and I did this. He, uh, he says, I got, I got something for you out of my car. I said, okay. So we go down to his car after church. He hands me the same camera back. He said, I was on a job site today, and this, there was a lady, she had this camera. She said her husband died. He really liked photography, but he doesn't use it. And she asked if she knew anyone in the church that might like photography, that might, might want to use the camera. She just gave me the exact same camera right back to me. Cast your bed upon the waters, I'll come back to you in many days hence. God, and I wasn't even planning to share it, because I actually forgot about it until right now as I was teaching. But we can never outgive God. Amen. We can never outtrust the Lord. Amen. Amen? Amen. But it wasn't a preacher that Kim told me to do that. It wasn't a preacher like me, but it was a better preacher. It was the Holy Spirit. Amen? 
He's the best preacher. Amen? He knows how to deal with our hearts and draw us closer to God. And that's what God's trying to do in your life today. Draw you closer to Him. And He's constantly doing it. It's a constant process. Further up, further in. God wants to do a great work in our life. And so God is so good to us. Let's move on now. This is the idea that God is above and He's below us. He's all around us, helping us every step of the way. But we must willingly submit to His to His will. Let's move now back into Colossians. I only got like a, you know, a couple verses. God's good. God knows. All right. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you being dead in your sins, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now notice the two things here. He's, re he's reiterating, once again, he says what? And he said, he, excuse me, hath he quickened together. So who did the quickening? It means to be made alive. God did. It was God that quickened us. We didn't quicken ourselves. We didn't make ourselves alive. That's what that word means. And so we were dead in our sins and trespasses and uncircumcision of our heart, our hardened heart. God quickened us. God made us alive. He quickened us together with him. And he's forgiven us how many trespasses? All, All of them. Amen? So if you've asked God to forgive you, you're forgiven. Go on unto perfection. He goes on to say this, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary, that was against us which was contrary to us, I'm reading verse 14, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Notice, he took it out of the way. We didn't take it out of the way. And then verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, uh, triumphing over them. So God was the one that did the work. Jesus did all the work and he did it gloriously. He did all the work and he did it gloriously. I could take it, Isaiah, for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that because I'm still looking at where we're at. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8, Wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high and he led captivity captives and gave gifts unto men. He goes on to say in Revelation 1 and 18, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus did all the work. Jesus did all the work and not only did he do it, he did it gloriously. He completely whooped up on Satan. He took the devil's own tool. He said, go ahead. He did, he, he did pretty much what you never do. What do you never do? You never let the devil lay the playing field. You never, you never fight on his turf. Right. That's right. Amen. Yep. That's right. But Jesus said, "You go ahead, mate. You go ahead and set this. <laughs> give me, give me. You, I'll get. I'll, I'll, I'll beat you with both hands tied around my back, tied behind my, tied behind my back. You go ahead, devil. Do whatever. Let everything out. Do everything you can. And the devil unleashed everything that he had against Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And on the third day, our Lord still rose again. Amen. And so we can say this." That no matter what the no matter what the devil does, when the when the power of God abides in your life, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. The devil can try to pull out all the stops and try to stop you. But if you'll put your faith on wavering faith in Christ, you will win every time because Jesus never fails. He has not changed, his power has not diminished. He is able to, to conquer every situation in your life, just as he did on the cross of Calvary over two thousand years ago. He is the answer. He is the solution. He is the one that we need. Amen? Amen. How many know God loves you today? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm looking at this. I want to keep going, but it's time to stop. So appreciate the Lord. How many know God loves you? Amen. Amen. How many looking forward to what God's going to do? Amen. So we'll get it. We'll wrap up chapter two next week by the power, by the grace of God. But remember, it's God that does the work. It's God that does the work. So when you get when something glorious happens in your life, just remember it's because of Jesus. Give him all the glory. Give him all the credit. Worship him. Praise him. Glorify his name. And God will continue to do it. And I'm going to close as, as I get, as we get ready to close. I'm going to just talk about one of my buddies, Sister Denton. Sister Denton, uh, she's a blessing. She's helping take care of Sister Davis right now. And I'm going to share something about her because I thought this has always been such an encouragement. I had the privilege of being her pastor for a little while, for a couple of years. And um, she's such a, she was such a blessing. She, uh, she had an issue, a health issue, where she was diabetic, and she had to basically eat at certain intervals during the course of the day. At this time in her life, she was tight financially. God's blessed her since then. God's been good to her. And she had just enough money, and she would go to Costco to get hot dogs when she had her lunch break. And she had just enough money for a hot dog. She didn't have enough money for anything to drink. She was really tight at this time in her life, financially. And so she told me this story at church one night. She was like, Pastor, I went to... Costco, and I was so thirsty, but I know I knew I needed to eat because I'm diabetic. And um, so I'm sitting there in line. I said, Lord, I really want something to drink. 
I know I've got to spend this money on something to eat, though. And so she's sitting there just praying. She just really wants something to drink. And she got up to the, she got ready to, was, there was one man in front of her. The man bought a couple hot dog meals, I guess. Pizzas. pizzas, was it? Two pizzas. And he turned around and looked at Sister Denton. He said, I just bought two meals. They come with a drink. Would you like one? And she, and she just, she's like, yes! And she, you know, and if you know Sister Denton, you could give her a million dollars or you could bless her with an iced tea. And she acts like it's the same amount of a miracle. Yes. The small things in life, she gets so excited about. God's so good to me, Pat. She was sitting there telling me this in the back of the church. She was like, he gave, gave me something to drink. My God's so good. And she gets so excited. Like, and God would just constantly hook her up. Because everything, whether it was small or big, she just worshiped God and was so excited. And she made this statement. One time I had her stand and testify in church, and she said, and this was her testimony. She said, once you give your life to Jesus, be prepared to be pampered. Yes. <laughs> And, that, and she went through her shares of difficulties, just like we all do. But you know what? When you got your eyes on Jesus, you look beyond the difficulties. You see all the good things God's doing in your life. Amen. Amen. And so what I'm here to do is tell you tonight is trust the Lord. Give your heart to him completely. Just be a, just whatever God does, he deals with your heart, do the best you can to respond to it. And God will bless you. And you'll step back like so many else have after it's all said and done. And you'll say like the Apostle Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Our prayer like this, Reverend Torres, the close of service in prayer. We have church tomorrow night at 730. And we're looking forward to it. Reverend Torres is going to be preaching. He just found that out right now. So God's good. All right. Bless you, sir. Thank you, Reverend Father, for this Bible study tonight, oh God, to recognizing all the goodness that comes from your son, Jesus Christ, oh God, all the blessings, everything that you have for us, oh God, that you're not willing to withhold anything, not even your precious son, Jesus. Thank you for all the blessings that come in your son, Jesus Christ, and to keep them in the forefront of our hearts and of our minds. To be number one in our lives, oh God, we love you, we thank you, and what was taught tonight, may you find a lodging place in our heart, oh God, that we would bring glory to you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 amen.